um i just went on vacation um this last week um, many of you know i went out uh, we went to like a wedding but we also morphed it into a family vacation and it was very nice i was actually encouraged by it um, my cousin whose wedding i went to um, growing up was probably the naughtiest little boy i ever met uh, if you guys think you've seen a naughty kid before honestly i don't think i'm allowed to speak half of the things i've seen him do um just the naughtiest kid i've ever met in my entire life encouragingly enough though like if you think about it this kid grew up to be probably the most spiritual person i've ever met and now like going to a wedding and seeing it be such a god thing it was awesome you know they prayed right before he got married together him and his best men his best men came up to me and they heard that we had started a church plant and asked how they could pray for us in the church plant like it was it was very encouraging to go on this vacation. Uh, also, I mean, I could preach a whole sermon series just on the beautiful creation that God created and, and general revelation. Um, it was so amazing just to see God's world and what he did with it. Um, and so I was just, it's been very encouraging to be on vacation. Now I'm back, getting back into the flow. Um, so today, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 34. And today we're going to be talking about showing God. As I was meeting all these different Christians, it's so nice to meet Christians in different cities and just know you're part of the same family, right? You're, you're part of God's family. And this is something I think traveling missionaries probably see better than most, where they go to different countries, they go to different cities, talk about God, talk about missions, and they meet all these different Christians who are encouraging, who are part of God's plan and on mission for God. And it was just so encouraging for me to meet all these Christians. And I, and I started to think to myself, you know, I, you know, when we think of like sharing Christianity or showing people about God, we automatically go to like passing out tracts, passing out pamphlets, or having those awkward conversations about how Jesus is the only way. But there's more to showing others who our God is than just talking about the gospel. We're going to be talking about the gospel today, but there are more ways to do that. And so number one in the different ways to be a witness, the different ways to show others about our God, I think it's very good to ask God to pray, to ask God to make you a voice, a witness of an encouragement to those who are discouraged in this life. Psalm 34, four through five states i sought the lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed i think god puts us in this life for many different reasons you see like god just doesn't take us out of this existence out of this world the second we become a christian and say hey come on up with me join the party he desires us to live in this life, to grow, and to be an encouragement to those who are discouraged. This could be discouraged Christians and discouraged non-church people, people who aren't Christians. He brings us into this world to encourage those who are not having a good time. You see, God knows in this life, people are going to have bad times. They're going to lose their job. Their marriages are going to break up. Their family is going to be broken up. There's going to be relationship problems, job problems. There's going to be health issues. And so many different things in this life leads people to discouragement. And yet in those moments, as Christians who have sought the Lord, who have seen God answer our prayers, and who has delivered us from our fears, he plants us in this life like a tree next to running water where we see all those who are going through the different valleys in this life, who are discouraged, who are distraught, who are downtrodden. And in those moments, God desires us to help, to encourage. It's amazing how I've actually seen where people have heard the gospel and wanted nothing to do with the gospel, wanted nothing to do with Christianity. And yet, in moments when they were encouraged, when they were at their lowest, I've seen God use those moments 
do amazing things, do things where the brightest and smartest arguments in the world could have done no damage, could have had no effect in those lowest of low moments. Encouragements can actually help the discouraged to see God in a way and in a light that they've never seen him before. So number one, ask God to make you a voice of encouragement to those discouraged around you. It could be your family, your kids, your parents, your brothers, your sisters. It could be your friends, coworkers, boss. You never know who God is leading you to. It could even be your next door neighbor, literally. There's so many different people in this life, schoolmates, whoever it is. It could be someone even at church on a Sunday who puts on a nice face, but is who is having a, a bad week. Be God's encouragement. You know, we always hear this idea of the church is God's hands and his feet in this world and in this life. And that is true. And God leads us as his hands, as his feet, to be an encouragement to those who are discouraged around us. We always hear this idea of, you know, be a positive influence in this world. Often I find myself being the negative Nancy that I am often mocking um, certain Christian radio um, that talks about being a positive influence in this negative world. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 gives us this idea of one of the goals that Jesus has for his followers. As little Christians, we are to be like Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 says, You are the light of of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. He desires us to be a light. Jesus, the one who died on the cross to be our way, to be our life, to be our light, desires us to be like him and to be the light of this world. And so in this life, God desires us to be a positive presence wherever we are at. And that, that doesn't mean just be like a general positive, nice going, you know, hug all the time type of a person. God desires us to love people. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the last time I preached about how God desires us to love our neighbors, to love our spouses, to love our enemies, to love, our, you know, all these different sorts of people that God has given into our life. We are the salt of the world. We are the light of the world. We are to be a positive presence in this world. This world is ultimately full of negative things. We lived in a sin-cursed world where all of us live in a system controlled by the devil, in a world that constantly tempts us with flesh that is always failing. And we are ourselves always in that battle, in the midst of that battle, within our own selves and our own desires. And yet God says, in the midst of all of that, be a light. Allow the light of God to seep through you every day, so much so that no matter who you touch, whether it's just your kids and your spouse or your coworkers or whoever you deal with on a regular daily basis, allow yourself to have the light of the world come into you and shine through you to everyone you're with. So be that positive presence. Be that type of a person who allows God to be so affecting you that when people walk away, they notice something's different. They notice that you've been with God. They notice that light that's within you. So number one, be an encouragement to the discouraged. Be a, number two, be a positive presence. But also number three, speak truth into a world of deception. Turn to Ephesians 4 and verse 15. And this is what I mean, by the way, that as Christians, we are not just kumbaya, we love everything, love everybody, are okay with all ideals. Still within this world, while we are to be the light, while we are to be love incarnate as we follow God, who is the true love, we are also to be speaking truth. This is so important because love without light isn't helpful, and light without love isn't going to do anything. 
So Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 states, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. This world, I don't know if you know or if, if you've dealt with a lot of deception in your life, or maybe you're just avoiding all deception. You just don't want to deal with it. But there's so much deception in this world. Whether it's those who believe in naturalism, those who don't believe in God, those who don't think you can ever be certain about anything, or those who don't care and don't think it's important. Those who believe in different religions, different gods, different idols, or they just believe in themselves and having a good, fun time and hedonism. All of us in this life actually have a bent towards some kind of deception, and we very easily believe different things that we want to believe. And we're full of deception. You see it all throughout the scriptures. Where literally the scriptures are lined with people who are not great and good and godly natural people, but they're awful sinners whom God saved with his truth out of their own deception. And this is part of that truth-saving process that God wants us to be a part of. He wants us to grow up from where we are at, to not stay where we are at, and to be a part of his saving process, where God, as we are his hands and the feet on this earth, that we are a part of the, the truth that he speaks to the world. And this, is being, and this is part of being the salt and light that he desires us to be a part of, to be people who not only love and befriend and encourage those who are discouraged, but to, in those moments, speak truth. To not do so in a proud, I'm way better than you type of a way, but in love, knowing that we don't deserve anything. To say, this is the God who saved me. Tell them our stories about how objective truth from Jesus Christ came into our lives and changed us and changed our direction and helped us see God as he is. It's very important throughout all of this to understand that God desires us, yes, to love our enemies, but also speak truth to our enemies. To, yes, love our spouse, but, yes, speak truth to our spouse to love our family, our, our parents, our kids, our neighbors, but to speak truth. It's so important that our light does not fade and point in the wrong direction, but that we continue as Christians to always point towards Jesus and his true gospel. Number four, show the love of Jesus to those who've lost hope. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. I love the book of Romans. So easy to just use only verses from Romans. So I tried to branch out of Romans today and use some other verses. Romans 5 and verse 5 says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I love this because God pours out his love to us, into our hearts. As Christians, the Holy Spirit has been given to us, and because we have the Holy Spirit, we have hope. I think it for me, like... I get to the point where I've, I've been trusting in Jesus for so long and I've had this hope that when I don't, that when I meet someone who doesn't have that same hope, it doesn't always translate. Like I don't always get what's wrong or, or what they're lacking. And many times people who don't have long-term hope, who don't have present hope, they, they don't always manifest. They don't come out and say, you know, I, I just don't have hope. It translates into their emotions being skewed into themselves, not having certain long-term 
goals in their life, and, and they're kind of just wandering through this life, grasping for things. They don't know what they're missing many times. It's almost an intangible for them. Like they know, they seemingly know that there's some type of hope out there, but they don't know exactly what it is, and they probably don't think it's Jesus. And yet, here is the scriptures clearly telling us we have God's love who's been poured out into our hearts. We have the Holy Spirit has been given to us, and we have a hope that the world doesn't have. Romans 5, it goes through all these different things and how God has been producing hope in us through suffering, through endurance, through character. It's been produced. It's not something that happens overnight that clicks and we're just awesome and we have hope automatically. It's true. We have hope when we believe in Jesus Christ. But hope is something that God desires us to show. Because we are Christians, we are little Christs. When people see us, obviously they're going to see a broken down version of Jesus. We're not going to be perfect all the time. But even in through our imperfections, they will see cracks through our imperfections and they will see the fact that we have this hope in Jesus, this hope in God. And it will be attractive to those who do not have hope. To those who hope in other things where the foundation of that hope is slippery, is shaky, does not hold, and does not stand the test of time, we have a hope that does all of those things and more. So hope, show hope. Show people what you believe in and that it affects you and that it changes you and that it guards you through whatever you go through. Obviously, we're never going to be perfect at this, but this is something the Holy Spirit helps us through. Through all of our suffering, through all, all of our endurance and all of our character and however much we mess up through all of that, the Holy Spirit will give us that hope that will not only carry us through the end, but will show others and point others to the very God who carries us. Number five, be a friend to someone who is lonely. Have you ever noticed, I mean, COVID right now in general, lots of people are isolated, lots of people don't have lots of friends. I've probably heard more about loneliness and suicide within the last two years than I've ever heard in my entire life, where people are starting to quantify the fact that there is actual ramifications to loneliness, more so publicly than I think has ever been shown. Turn to Psalm 27 and verse 10. I think as we see this more and more through the pandemic, it's a bigger and bigger issue than we've probably ever really given its weight to. Psalm 2710 says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. This is something... Like, there, there's a lot of emotion, obviously, to that. This is something that can be taken generally with the fact that, you know, in people's lives, they're going to lose those who are closest to them. Whether it's to death, to disease, or whether it's to rejection. Nowadays, there are so many different things that separate mankind. There's racism. There's all different types of sin. There's all different types of separation, whether, you know, people are different on the spectrum of politics, where people are separating over all these different things and defriending people. And during all of this, loneliness is on the rise. I believe through the scriptures that God desires to take us in when others forsake us. Whether it's in the scriptures as it says, father and mother, if parents forsake people, take them in and be the arms of Jesus. 
or whether it's family and friends or whoever is being forsaken in this life, I believe that Jesus desires us to be the type of people, to be a community in Milwaukee in 2021 that takes people in when they're lonely and forsaken. To be like God. To love in this way. Again, this is something I've noticed in my life, like, I've had scriptural arguments, argued about other religions, about atheism, agnosticism, and all of those seem to have beat up against strong walls that couldn't do anything to someone's heart and mind. But I've seen befriending people and loving them be a part of moving mountains in that person's life. I believe God desires us and there's, there's so many more verses on this, to, be, to befriend those who are lonely in this time, to be on the lookout for those who have no friends, who, for those who are lonely, and be God's hands and his feet towards them. Also, I believe it's important to live with integrity. It doesn't matter if you try to love and befriend, if you try to do all these other five things that I've already talked about, in the end, if you don't live with integrity, it's all going to fall down and crash. Proverbs 28, 6. Turn to Proverbs 28 and verse 6. It's the same idea of the golden rule that Jesus talked about of doing unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Proverbs 28, 6 says, Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. It was always odd to me that Jesus came as a poor man into this life. Like, if you think about it, Jesus, as he entered into humanity and into this world, he could have come in any different life he wanted. He could have chosen to be a king. He could have chosen to have been a rich person, or at least not like a low, low, poor person who had to work, for, you know, a low job his whole life. Jesus came down and lived with integrity. He was the only person who lived his entire life sinlessly and called us all to repent and follow him, to be like him. And everywhere he went, he talked about loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and talked about how the golden rule was so, so important. When we start to put our faith in him, when we believe in Jesus Christ and decide that he is the way, the truth, and the life, there has to be this idea that as we follow him, we have to be people who live with integrity. Who in our business, in our life, in our marriage, in our family, we live with integrity. Not because we think we're better, not out of pride, not to be better than anyone else. But because grace and mercy has been extended to us. Because we follow our creator and our redeemer. That's the why behind why we live with integrity. But I think that's so important because I've even noticed in my own life, like just working a hard job and helping out those in your work has led people to start asking questions about the God that you believe in and have led to great, great conversations and good times where I talk to people about God. It happens in my marriage. When I live with integrity in my marriage, I've noticed God works not only in my life, but also in my spouse's, many times unintentionally. I've seen it with my kids. When you live with integrity, your kids start to see it. You know, they, they would know. <laughs> of all people, I think kids, maybe besides your wife, know best when a preacher lives a two, two-faced life. When he lives one way in the pulpit, in front of the church people, and one way at home. Kids see straight through that. <laughs> like, and that's what like, I love about my kids. They, they can see straight through me all the time. And this is so important, not just for their own life, but for your own, for our own. For all of us to live the same way all the time with integrity. 
and it will help show the gospel. It will help show God to those who are around you. And I think sometimes we pass on by it and we think, oh, it's automatic. Obviously, everyone should live that way. But we always, I don't think we always give it its due, the fact that we need to live that way to be a follower of Jesus. I also think it's important to practice irrational generosity. I like that word, um, irrational. It gives us this, I mean, because everyone, I think everyone, even non-Christians, practice generosity to some extent, right? We all, many people give to charities and we help out here and there. And, you know, every once in a while when a beggar comes, you give him some money if you have some. I typically never have cash in my pocket. So um, this is important, though. Uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Hebrews 13 and verse 16. States, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is something where I think it's really, I mean, there's a couple different things here. Um, you can do a whole list of sermons on generosity. But generosity is something that God desires us to give out of a cheerful heart, right? The scripture says, but also in a sacrificial way. I know it's not just American Christians in this year, but it's so easy to give when it's super comfortable. Um, it's very easy for me to give like a certain amount and to budget out and be like, oh, it's fine. You know, it's not going to hurt my budget. It's not going to hurt my lifestyle. I'm going to be comfortable and I'm going to give God just this little portion here. You know, I'll give it to the church. I'll give it to people. I'll give it to whatever. God desires us to sacrificially give. You see that when Jesus, you know, saw the poor person, the poor lady, give her last mite. And then all the rich people came around, they gave way more than her. Notice that the ruler of the universe saw her heart, saw how much she gave comparatively to what she had. It might have been her next meal's worth of food and praised her for doing that, for that gift as a sacrifice. I think it's so important as Christians today to sacrificially give. And not just sacrificially give, but back to this word irrational. Like I said, everyone gives to some extent. When you irrationally give, people take notice. It's something, and you don't do it just for, obviously the scripture even talks about don't give for other people, you know, make sure that people don't know. Um, but it's this idea of when you practice irrational generosity, people will see God in that. People will see the love of Jesus through your generosity, and it can be a tool to wake them up spiritually. It is a metaphor many times for how God irrationally gave to us through his son Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. That was irrational. It seemingly was irrational. This idea that you would go that far to die for someone. When we give and give irrationally, because we're Christians, because God's mercy has been given to us in such a way where it shakes us out of our stupor, of our selfishness, and of our life, God can use it in a miraculous way. So practice irrational generosity where it doesn't always make sense. I've used this with my kids. Obviously, as a parent, you never need an excuse to give your kids something, right? I love giving my kids things. Um, but sometimes doing this and then telling them that this is like how God gave his son Jesus that this is what a gift is, and using it. And you can see it as their eyes dawn with understanding that they don't always deserve things, and yet sometimes they are given things, not because they are deserving. This is uh, quite an amazing thing to see, especially when they're naughty. 
and it shakes us, shakes them out of it, and it, and it starts to change their mind and get their gears running in a different way. And so practice irrational generosity. That's one way that we can show God to the world around us, show the world around us the God that we believe in. Also, be a voice of hope to the hurting. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. I don't know if both verses are up there. I'll read both. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There's a caution and an encouragement to these verses here. I think I've, I've seen it where we're too quick to just throw a verse at somebody who, who is hurting, thinking that that automatically will help them. Sometimes people want a verse to be encouraged, and that's great. Sometimes when we throw out a super spiritual Bible verse, like everything's going to work out for good, when a child dies unexpectedly may not always be the brightest thing. Sometimes God desires us to be a voice of hope to the hurting just by giving them a hug, to weep with them, to be there with them through the pain and the suffering. Yes, there will be a time for sharing scripture. Look for wisdom in when to do that. Also, obviously, spread the gospel, right? Romans Road is how I became a Christian. Um, you know, looking through Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, finding out that I'm a sinner, that I missed the mark. Romans 6.23, that, you know, I, that the wages of sin is death, that I deserved hell. Romans 5.8, that God showed his love while I was a sinner, while I was an enemy of the gospel, while I was an enemy of God. And then going to Romans 10, 10 and 13, showing that I need to call on God's name, that I need to believe in him. Spreading the gospel clearly, being able to articulate what the gospel is, is so important. There will be times in our life where people will ask us about the gospel. There will be times where they don't ask us about the gospel, but God wants us to sh share it. Have you ever had that moment where you felt like God maybe wanted you to have said something about the gospel? Look for those moments. And lastly, I want to end with Micah 6, 8. In the Old Testament here. It may take me a little bit longer to find. Micah 6, 8. It says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. God desires us to do justice, to be concerned with justice. And those who are around us in our life, to be kind, to love mercy, right? As some translations say, and to walk humbly. I think that's so important as a benchmark because I think honestly, if we don't walk humbly, we're gonna miss out on all of these. If we're not humble enough to know that we need to come to God, we need the scriptures, we need church, we need to pray, we're going to miss out on wanting to live justly, wanting to love mercy. We're going to miss out on knowing the gospel to spread the gospel like the Romans road. To be a voice of hope to the hurting, to practice irrational generosity, living with integrity, being a friend to the lonely, showing the love of Jesus to those who lost hope, speaking truth in a world of deception, being a positive presence, a light in the world, and being a voice of encouragement to the discouraged. I believe God desires us to show him and his love to all different types of people with all different types of hurts. And I think these are some tools, these are some examples, some ideas of how to do that.
It's not exhaustive. The list could go on and on. There's some things that God has been working in my heart recently to share with you guys to show God to the world and how to be a witness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for who you are and what you've done with our life. You've given us hope. You've changed us. You've put us on a new path together as a family called Redemption Way. I thank you for this journey. I thank you for what you've done in our lives. Continue to bless it as we watch you work. In Jesus' name, amen.